Hello again. Remember last time we were talking about the Hyksos, those mysterious people that were not exactly sure who they were, but they did conquer Egypt or rule Egypt? Well, there are two theories, remember, about how they got into Egypt. One was that they had been living there. There were Semitic people living in Egypt, and maybe they multiplied and just took over. The other theory is that perhaps they were a little more militaristic and conquered Egypt. There's one little bit of evidence that sort of supports the conquering theory. They introduced the horse and chariot into Egypt. Before the Hyksos, there are no horses in Egypt. And with a chariot, it gives you a really important military advantage. So I think it may be the conquer theory that works. But the curious thing is, the Bible tells us a lot about Israelites being in Egypt. But there's no archaeological evidence for it. We don't have a lot of sites that say, ah, look, Israelite stuff. Now, archaeology has confirmed an awful lot of things about the Bible. And among Egyptologists, we wonder, how come? You know, why, for example, is there no ex Exodus evidence? You know, Exodus, big event. Not much archaeological evidence. There's also another story before Exodus, the Joseph story. And what we're going to do today is look at the Joseph story and see what an Egyptologist can make out of it. Does it ring true? Right? Now, your homework assignment for tonight, and everybody do it, is get out your Bible and read Genesis 37 to 50. That's where our Joseph story is. But let's start with the story. Now, according to the Bible, Joseph has a skill, and it deals with dreams. Right? He's special because of dreams. First, he has dreams. And in his dreams, he sees 11 plants bowing down to him, right? Sheaths. And he also sees 11 stars bowing down, right? And thrown into this is the sun and the moon, right? Perhaps his mother and his father. But the 11 certainly refer to his brothers. He has 11 brothers. And Joseph interprets this as, you're all going to bow down to me. Now this, of course, does not endear Joseph with his brothers, right? They do not like this. He is also a favorite of dad. If you'll remember, he has a special coat, right? It's the coat of many colors, right? It's actually colored cloth is what it says. And that was kind of special. Not everybody had a colored coat. So Joseph is the apple of dad's eye, and his brothers don't like it. So they tie him up, <laughs> throw him in a well, right? And they're discussing whether to leave him there, he'll die or not. But Ishmaelites come along, and Joseph is sold to these guys on their way to Egypt and he is sold into slavery. Now Joseph arise, arrives in Egypt and is sold to Potiphar. Potiphar is an official, he's, a, he's an important man, and he is sold to Potiphar. But Joseph is industrious, works hard, he's clever, and he's successful. He's a slave, but he's quite successful. But then there's a bit of treachery. Potiphar's wife takes a shine to Joseph, makes advances. But Joseph is virtuous, rejects the advances. Potiphar's wife, rejected, is kind of ticked off, and she accuses him of attempting to rape her. He probably dis disarranges a robe, and Joseph is thrown into jail unjustly. And so he lands in jail. Now in jail, he meets up with two other inmates. One is the cupbearer to the pharaoh, right? Now, that's an important position. It's a cupbearer. He's wound up in jail. But the cupbearer has a dream, and it involves grapes, three bunches of grapes, and they're squeezed into a cup. And he wonders what it means. Now, the other inmate is the baker. And he has a dream that he's carrying his little cakes that he's baked on his head on a tray and birds come and eat the three cakes. They don't know what it means. And Joseph says, I can interpret dreams. And he interprets the dreams. And he says to the cupbearer, you're going to go free in three days. And the baker, you're going to be hanged in three days. And sure enough, it comes to pass. One is executed, and the other goes free. And Joseph says to the cupbaker, Cup, the cupbearer. He says, don't forget me when you get back to the Pharaoh's palace. I'm stuck in jail. Right? Of course, he forgets Joseph. He goes back. Joseph is still in jail. But then Pharaoh has dreams. Right? This is really a story about dreams and about 
interpretation of dreams. Pharaoh has dreams. He sees seven lean cows devouring seven fat cows. Doesn't know what it means. He sees seven lean ears of corn devouring seven fat ears of corn. Doesn't know what it means. He calls his magicians to interpret what it means. They don't know. That's when the cupbearer remembers, ah, Joseph, there was this guy in jail who was a dream interpreter. And Joseph is called to interpret the Pharaoh's dreams. Now, Joseph has an interpretation. Joseph says, what it means is this. You're going to have seven lean years eventually. But the good news is you'll have seven good years first. So you're going to have seven fat years, so to speak, followed by seven lean years. Based on Joseph's interpretation of dreams, the economy of Egypt is planned for the next 14 years. The idea is, look, if we're going to have seven good years, and we know we're going to have seven really lean years, what we do is we put grain aside. We store it up during the seven fat years. And then, when the really hard times come, we'll be OK. So based on Joseph's interpretation of dreams, the Pharaoh listens to him. The economy is planned for 14 years. This is what the Bible says. Now, we're also told that Joseph is, of course, out of jail and elevated. He's going to become the vizier of Egypt, the prime minister. He is given a gold seal of authority. And we're also told something that's rather cryptic. In the Bible, it says, and, and, and there's a suggestion that Joseph has become a wonderful man. Everybody loves him. Everywhere he went, they cried after him, Abrik. Now, what is Abrik? We'll talk about that later, but it's a, it's a sort of enigmatic phrase. Everywhere Joseph went, they cried after him, Abrik. The reason it's enigmatic is, of course, it means nothing in Hebrew. Nothing. So Joseph is prospering. They're putting aside grain. And famine hits not only Egypt, but the whole Middle East. Now, Joseph's family, his father, Jacob, who is Jacob called Israel, right? It's the same person. Jacob was called Israel. Now, El, of course, means God. And Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord and had power, so he's called Israel also, right? So Jacob called Israel, has his 11 sons still, right, in the north. And famine hits. So what does he do? He sends down his sons into Egypt because they have grain. He sends not all 11, though. He keeps back his favorite, Benjamin. Now, he's his favorite because he's the only son by Rachel, by the favored wife. Now, the name is interesting, by the way, Benjamin, both in Hebrew and Arabic. You know, they're both Semitic languages, and they're very close. Yamin means right, right, on the right side. Ben means son. Benjamin has the place of honor. He's the son on the right hand of his father, on the right hand side of his father. That's what Benjamin means. And remember, when we talked about Middle Kingdom tombs in Beni Hassan, Beni, the sons of Hassan. Even the country Yemen, for example, it's Arabic for on the right. When you entered into Yemen, you made a right turn to get into Yemen, Yamin, right? So Benjamin, the son on the right hand of his father, special one. He doesn't want to lose Benjamin. Benjamin stays behind. But the other 10 brothers go into Egypt, and they have to ask for food. Right? They come with money. They're going to buy food. They meet up with Joseph, who is distributing grain. Joseph recognizes them, but they don't recognize Joseph. He's changed. Years have passed. He's a big official. They don't recognize Joseph. And he asks, you know, do you have any other brothers? And he says, uh, well, we got one. Benjamin's back home. And he says, you know, he really wants to see this other brother. Bring him. That's a big one. Now, the brothers are sent home. 
But Joseph has played a trick on them. He has put their money back in their sacks along with the grain. So the brothers are going home both with food and the money, but don't know it. And they return home, and their father's upset about the money, certainly concerned about Benjamin going into Egypt. Right? But he sends Benjamin. Right? Benjamin goes. Benjamin has a reunion with Joseph. Not quite recognized, right? Not quite recognized. He sees Benjamin. And what he does is Joseph puts in the sack of the brothers for, with the grain a silver cup. A silver cup. It's a trick. The silver cup is discovered, you know, and Benjamin is kept as hostage as the brothers are sent back home. Right? Benjamin, the one that the father is going to miss the most, is in Egypt. Now, finally, the family is reunited. We have a reunion. They go back into Egypt. Joseph reveals who he is. He forgives. It's a tearful reunion. Right? And Joseph, in some way it seems, has been sent by God to assure the well-being of Israel. Now, Israel both his father and Israel the people. Right? So there's a reunion. And Jacob, the father, comes to live in Egypt. Now, we're even told where they live, right? There's this family reunion. He lives in the land of Goshen. That's the delta. That's where the Hyksos were. But that's where the family settles, right? So we get this very nice story of a reunion, forgiveness, protection. And Jacob, the patriarch, the father, has a vision. God tells him, I will bring you out of Egypt. It's a little bit like the Exodus foretold. He's going to come out of Egypt, right? Now, the famine is proceeding, though. Right? The 14 years aren't up by any means. And as the famine proceeds, Joseph shows what a sharp businessman he is. Now, remember, he's not a free wheeler. He's working for the Pharaoh. Everybody worked for the Pharaoh. As the famine proceeds, the Pharaoh has the grain stored. But now the people don't have what to eat. The farmers aren't growing crops. The famine is hit. But they need food. Joseph buys their land. He gives them grain. It's not the Pharaoh being magnanimous. Mm -mm. The Pharaoh gives them grain to eat, but he's buying up land. So soon the pharaoh is going to own virtually all the land in Egypt. With one exception. There's a nice little detail here that, that we'll talk about in a little while. The exception is the priest's land. Joseph does not buy the land owned by the temples. Now, pharaohs for years, for centuries, had given land to temples as donations. You know, if you really wanted to show the god you were in favor of him, you could give 100 acres to the temple. And then forever, the priest could be fed on the crops from that hundred acres. And they do not buy back the land of the temple. So the Egyptian priests keep their land. But Pharaoh is becoming very, very wealthy. Jacob dies. He blesses his sons. They're going to be the 12 tribes of Israel. Right? Blesses his sons. And he also requests burial outside of Egypt. Doesn't want to be buried in Egypt. And the Bible tells us, and this is exactly what it says, then Joseph ordered the doctors in his service to embalm his father. The doctors embalmed Israel, and it took 40 days for embalming. The Egyptians mourned him for 70 days. So we have Jacob being mummified like an Egyptian. One of the only two people in the Bible, by the way, who are mummified. Right? The other one is going to be Joseph. Right? And we know that a large retinue takes the body of Jacob, called Israel, out of Egypt for burial. So he gets his wish. Jacob, called Israel, is buried outside. Then Joseph dies. Now what happens to Joseph? 
He says, be sure to take my bones from here. He doesn't want to be buried in Egypt either. Right? And the story ends by telling us that they embalmed Joseph and laid him in his coffin. Right? Now, the story is an interesting one for a lot of reasons. First, we've got a lot of numbers. You know, 11 is interesting. Seven. You got seven, eleven. Three features also, remember, you have the three cakes on the head, the three, a lot of, a lot of threes, a lot of numbers. But we don't have any archaeological evidence for it. Were there ever a large number of Israelites in Egypt? What can we make of the story, right? And what I want to do today is kind of look at the story in an Egyptological view. Does it ring true? You see, there are two ways you can try to verify a story. One is you can look at external evidence. Do we have statues of Joseph? Do we have statues of Jacob? We don't have the name of anybody named Joseph in Egypt. There's no record that talks about a Joseph in Egypt. We don't. That's external evidence. But the other is internal evidence. Does the story hang together? Does it make a consistent, coherent tale? It's interesting. Let's look at it. First, Let's talk about the story of Potiphar, right, where Joseph is unjustly, unjustly accused of advances on Potiphar's wife. There happens to be an ancient Egyptian short story called The Tale of Two Brothers, which has just this feature. The good brother is working in the fields. The wife of the, ba of the, uh, the, the bad wife of one brother makes advances. He refuses it. She accuses him. So there's an Egyptian kind of tradition for this sort of story, right? That's not that impressive. What about Potiphar's name? It's an Egyptian name. It's a little bit garbled in, in the telling. But Padi, it's probably Padi Re, means Pa is that, D means given by Re, by Ra, the sun god. So Padi Re means given by the sun god. So Potiphar, at least, is a good name. It makes sense in Egyptian terms. Now, there's another. You see, we're doing a little bit of the other approach towards Egyptian history that I mentioned, the philological approach, looking at language. Now, there's a wonderful, wonderful bit of evidence in Pharaoh's magicians. Now, remember the magicians are called to interpret the dreams, but they can't. They don't know what the seven lean you know, ears of corn are, what the, what the fat cows are doing. They don't understand it. But in the Bible, it says Pharaoh called for his magicians. Now, Remember back to the lesson on language, that the latest form of Egyptian language, the latest form of the writing, is Coptic. Coptic was ancient Egyptian written in Greek, and the Copts, the Christians in Egypt, have their Bible, the Christian Bible, right? But they have the Old Testament, and they tell the story. They write the story, they have an Old Testament too, and they tell the story of Joseph. What is the word in Coptic for magician? That's going to be the coup. The word for Coptic the word in Coptic for magician in the Coptic Bible is sesh per ankh. Sesh per ankh. Now, remember, Coptic is ancient Egyptian. So does sesh per ankh mean anything? The answer is yes. Sesh per ankh is really three words. Sesh means scribe. Per is house. Ankh is life. The magicians are the scribes of the house of life. Now, the House of Life in Egypt was basically a theological college. It was a school associated with a temple, the House of Life, where priests were trained. So this rings true. You know, who is the Pharaoh going to call to interpret a dream? The priests of the House of Life. So it's kind of neat that you've got this, through Coptic, a little bit of internal verification. It's starting to make sense in Egyptian terms. Now, let me get a little further into this thing about priests interpreting dreams. In the Joseph story, you know, Joseph's real skill isn't having dreams. It's not like today. We think that people who have prophetic dreams are special, you know, the Gene Dixon types or whatever. That wasn't it in Egypt. The Egyptians believed that everybody had prophetic dreams. Let me go further. They believed that every dream was prophetic. The real skill was in interpreting, and that was Joseph's skill. Joseph isn't special because he has prophetic dreams. Everybody has them. Cupbearer, baker, pharaoh. 
Joseph knows how to interpret them. Now, in ancient Egypt, the priests were the interpreters of the dreams. Now, how did you get your dream interpreted? Well, the answer is, you went to the temple and you asked the priest. Now, one of the things that sort of bothered me for a long time in the Joseph story is that when Pharaoh calls his magicians to interpret the dream, they say, we don't know. That doesn't sound right. I mean, usually you get a magician, he's going to give you an interpretation of some sort. You know, why are these guys saying we don't know? Well, let me try to give you my answer to that. In ancient Egypt, when you went to a temple for an interpretation of a dream, they didn't free will. They didn't just say off the top of their heads, oh, that means this. No. They looked it up in a book. There were books of dream interpretation in the temples. There is a papyrus in the British Museum, which is a book for interpreting dreams. It's an interesting papyrus. What it's got, in one column it says, if a man sees himself, that's it, if a man sees himself, and then you've got another column going across saying, and it gives the dream. So it'll say, if a man sees himself with a dwarf, and that's a real dream listed in the book, if a man sees himself with a dwarf, then comes the interpretation, bad, and then detailed interpretation, half his life is gone. I guess the idea is the dwarf is like half a man, maybe. But this dream book had dream after dream, and you would look up the dream. So, for example, there's a dream. If a man sees his enemies making offerings, bad, people are working against them. Uh, so there are lots of lists and lists of dreams. Now, you went to a temple, the priest would take out the book and say, all right, let's look it up, right? He unrolls his papyrus. This isn't in the dream book of Pharaoh's magicians, you know? He's got a dream. Seven lean, right? Seven lean ears of corn devouring seven fat ears. They look it up in the book. Nothing like that, Pharaoh, right? So I think this is the explanation as to why, just why, the magicians say, no, we can't interpret it. And it bothered me, because you, know, you think magicians would usually make these things up. But I think the Egyptian dream book, the existence of an Egyptian dream book, to a great extent confirms the way dreams are dealt with in the Joseph story. You're special if you can interpret them, not if you have them, and not all dreams can be interpreted. If it's not in the book, you're stuck. Right? So Joseph has... Joseph's story has, has a lot of ring of truth in it. Let me ask you, you know, give you another one. Seven lean years are going to happen, right? Remember the seven fat years and then seven lean? Now, seven, first of all, is a magical number in Egyptian. It's a magical number. There are seven celestial cows. There are seven sacred oils. Seven is a big number. What about seven years of famine? Well, is there any evidence in Egypt that there was ever this kind of phenomenon? The answer is yes. In Sihel Island, now Sihel Island is in the southern part of Egypt, right next to Aswan. It's a large island in the middle of the Nile, covered with boulders, covered with boulders. And the boulders are great. They're big black boulders, and they're inscribed with hieroglyphs. When anybody wanted to say anything that he had done was great, he would go to Sahel Island, have it chiseled on, and it's there for eternity. So you've got all kinds of things. You've got military campaigns recorded. We came, we saw, we conquered, you know, and we did this. But you also have official records of kings. Kings had their sculptors come there and carve records of what happened. And on Sahel Island, there is a boulder that tells the story of a seven-year famine. A seven-year famine. Now, what would cause a seven-year famine? I mean, it could be other things. It could be locusts. It could be pests. It could be plague. The Nile didn't rise for seven years. It didn't rise high enough to give you real crops. Right? So, in Egypt, in Egypt, there is a tradition of a seven-year famine. Also, by the way, and as I say, you know, the Egyptians usually didn't record their defeats, the unhappy times. But this, in a sense, is presented as a good time because 
because the Nile didn't rise. The Pharaoh knew to make offerings to the gods, and then the Nile rose. So it's, it's really the Pharaoh solving it, and, and divine order is, is, is restored. But they usually didn't record bad times. But I'll tell you another strange one that sort of gives a little bit of, sort of very similar to, to this Joseph story. Near Unus's pyramid is a causeway. Remember, fifth dynasty, going way back. And there are some scenes on that. There are no hieroglyphs next to the scenes, so we're not sure what's being recorded. But it's a picture of people starving to death. It is a picture of people who look almost skeletal, very thin. There was a famine. These aren't people in captive. It doesn't look like captive, but something's going on. So we have a tradition in Egypt of a seven-year famine, that's because the Nile and Rye, we see people starving. We know that the dream story seems to ring true. You know, the feeling I get is that the Joseph story was written by somebody who knew Egypt. It, it's not just a kind of fairy tale by somebody making it up. Uh, somebody was in Egypt who knew about it. Now, there are other things, though. Let me give you some other things. Remember when Joseph interprets the dreams for Pharaoh? He's given a ring, a ring of gold. That is exactly what the pharaoh did to his viceroys, he did it to his ambassadors, and he did it to his viziers. The ring was a sign of authority. It was a signet ring. It would have your name on it. And you could seal things. I don't mean documents, that's, that's partly it. You know, you would, you would roll up a papyrus, put a lump of mud on it, put your signet in it, your signet ring in it, and then you'd have, nobody could open it. They couldn't seal it again, put the mud, and they wouldn't have that seal to do it. But you also sealed stores of grain. You had, grain was stored in large jars, big storage jars. And you would put across the top maybe a piece of linen or something, and right where it meets the end, you put your signet ring in a blob of mud. Nobody could steal the grain. So the idea that Joseph is given a gold ring, you, know, you wonder, why is Pharaoh giving him a gold ring? It's a sign of authority in Egypt. Again, somebody knew what they were talking about. One other thing, actually two other things. The phrase abrik, remember I said nobody really knows what it means? It said wherever Joseph went, they cried out after him, abrik. What we often try to do in Egyptology, if you get an inscription that doesn't make any sense that's supposed to be in another language, say it out loud and try to hear it in ancient Egyptian. Abrik, abrik, abrik. What, what does it mean? The best bet is that it's really three words. Now, if you remember back when I was talking about the Egyptian concept of the heart, and that you thought with your heart, and they have two words for heart. One was hat, which meant the foremost thing in your body, the most important thing in your body, and that's used in medical papyri. When you're doing anatomical stuff, they're talking about the heart. Hat. But the other word for heart is ib, or ab. Right, we're not even sure exactly how it's pronounced. So the first word probably means heart, ab. Now, the next part is rk, abrik, abrik. Well, the, the r, r often meant to, the preposition. Heart, to, and what's the k? K. That's you. It's a suffix pronoun. It comes at the end of a word, means you. So what it really means is like, your heart to you, or vaya con Dios, almost like go with God. May your heart remain with you. It's an Egyptian phrase that's kind of said when you put a, a traveler on the road. So when we have the Bible saying everybody cried out abrik after him, that's real Egyptian. That's, somebody knew what he was talking about. Now also, the idea that the priests kept their land, remember everybody else's land is being bought, but the priests are allowed to keep their land? Well, in a few lectures down the road, you're going to see there came a time in Egypt when the priests had so much land more than the pharaoh, that they took control of Egypt. So the priests certainly accumulated land. Another little, little datum that suggests that this thing is, you know, there's something going on here. And the last thing that I, that I love, I mean, because, you know, I'm a mummy person. That's my specialty, mummies. It says in the Bible, when they embalm them, it says, they embalmed them for 40 days and they mourned for 70. You know, for an awful long time, people didn't understand certain things about mummification. The mummification process itself, one major part of it, took 40 days. But the whole ritual and ceremony took 70. The Egyptians had to place somebody in the tomb 70 days after death. It had to be done after 70 days.
And that's what the Joseph story tells us. So internally, we get a really nice feeling that there's something true about the Joseph story. It's not archaeological evidence. It's internal evidence. But it seems to work. See you next time.